Now, now, if you wanted to do a fairly complex task like pick up a ball with your hand and throw it, mm -hmm. uh, that involves complex actions with a lot of different muscles. Uh, is that one of the goal of this type of prosthetic arm to be able to do complex motions like that? Yes. Actually, that's exactly where we want to go. Um, there's, you know, going from opening and closing, this is sort of the what we call single degree of freedom motion. So, you know, open, close, and then we could do that with one electric wire. But if we wanted to do something like this, that requires maybe two electric wire. Maybe you're mm -hmm. doing this, we require three electric wires. Just like that, and in order to do all of this, or use chopsticks mm -hmm. to, you know, grab ice cubes and then feed it to someone, it will probably require 20 wires. So the goal is to eventually get to the point where we can get that many differentiated signals from the brain and feed it to the prosthetics. Now, would the person have to learn to do these functions all over again? Because a child, when he first tries to grab something, he doesn't know how. He uses trial and error, mm -hmm. and eventually he finds a way that works, and then does it so much it becomes automatic. And if he tried to deconstruct it, it would be really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but now... It sounds like even with this type of device, you would have to deconstruct the actions and think of each individual muscle that would have to be moved. Actually, you touched a really, really important part. It's really interesting that, so now we take, uh, say, a 35-year-old person who happened to, you know, have an unfortunate maybe stroke, you know, early stroke and have a paralyzed limb. How could we actually get them to have to relearn just like when they're one-year-old? It's really hard. Turns out it's almost impossible to do everything exactly how they've done it. So that's where artificial intelligence comes in. So we get people to learn, but also at the same time, the machine side is also learning to that person how the brain signal works. So it's a mutual learning process. Now, the whole concept of artificial intelligence is extremely interesting because it seems to me that in trying to mimic intelligence, with machines, you would necessarily have to gain greater insight into the way real intelligence actually works. In the course of your research, have you learned anything interesting about how real intelligence functions? The word intelligence is a big one, of course. Um, but the reason why I ended up even studying neuroscience to begin with is because when I was halfway through the graduate school, really trying to learn more about artificial intelligence and how to control robots, I felt that I will never reach that ability to build tennis body with the current amount of technology that was available at that point, especially in AI. So I went into neuroscience to precisely trying to capture what are the ingredients about the human brain and the way we move, the way we learn, that we can bring back to AI. Um, and what did you find out? Uh, it's kind of a good question. It's the kind of things that I really tried to capture was to um, how we learn movement. So he, I'm going to give you an analogy with tennis. Mm -hmm. So when we play tennis and we say the ball bounces precisely in the same location every time and you learn to play, you know, you learn to hit that ball and then you get pretty good at it. And then, then the, the coach walks over to the other side and then now it says, I'm going to toss you the ball and then the ball bounces differently this time. For some reason, humans, us, we're able to adapt, right? We're able to sort of hit a little bit out of from where exactly how we learn to play. We generalize that learned information to somewhere else. That ability is not really a natural thing in robotics. In robotics, we encode exactly how many degrees that each joint has to move to make that motion possible. And if the ball bounces differently, it's out of luck. So that's sort of something that I've sort of tried to port in from neuroscience onto the artificial intelligence. Now, could robotics use trial and error similar to a human being? So, for example, let's say you want to teach a robot to stand up from a seated position and walk. Mm -hmm. Like when a, a baby learns how to do that, they don't know immediately it's trial and error. Mm -hmm. So could you program a robot that it knows the full range of motion of all of its own parts, it understands laws of physics like gravity, and inertia. Uh, it knows what its goal is. Its goal is to get from point A to point B, mm -hmm. or its goal is to throw a ball. It can look at the results it achieved, determine if it was close to the goal or not. Uh, if it wasn't good, maybe vary one of the uh, parameters and, and try something else and keep getting closer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. That's kind of 
what we do when we're learning, and that's what robots do. It's, but now we need to actually pick what's the, what's the goal, right? We yeah. need to really understand, you know, there are many ways to achieve the same thing. We can actually use the same hand and an arm and then this mug, and we can drink this in many, many different ways, right? Infinitely many different ways. Um, and somehow, over time, we've learned to use this part, and we've, instead of using all fingers, somehow maybe learned to use few, mm -hmm. you know, three fingers to do it. So those are very interesting observations mm -hmm. of humans that we make and says, why are people picking to do it in a certain way? And what does it mean? What are the things that are being optimized? Is it the energy, total amount of energy that we use? Is it the, you know, the amount of, you know, the, the kind of path? Maybe we take a straight path to get to a place. Um, there are all kinds of, you know, different ways that we can look at how humans compute the motion that it's about to make. So does the robot need to remember what it did before and remember what the results of that action were? Mm -hmm. in order, and, and then you have to uh, program it and tell it what the goal is, whether to you do it with the least amount of effort or the least amount of separate motions. Mm -hmm. or so, so there's a lot of ways. I don't, we're not at the point where the robot can make those decisions by itself, I don't think. Um, yeah, it's, I think, uh, you know, the, so in the spectrum of things, of uh, where the current prosthetic users who are wearing most advanced robotic prosthetic system to where the research is really diving in to find out how to control those things in, you know, 20 years down the line. The kind of conversation we're having is this side, mm -hmm. 20 years down the line. Hopefully, we're all the kind of research that we are finding out from the field of neuroscience as well as building up in, in, in AI will really try and get to the point where we're controlling what people are wearing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. and now, what's the most challenging part of robotics? What are some of the most difficult problems you have to solve to get the robots to do what you want? Whew, that's a very hard question. I like hard <laughs> but, questions. <laughs> um, I mean, it is... Is it in the software programming? It's, it's in a lot of places. So anywhere from mechanism itself and material, right? So durable material that can really withstand on a daily basis wear and tear. Well, we do really well with wear and tear. Skins just peel off every day. We just don't know as much of it. But, you know, can we build a material that renew itself so that we can just keep using it? That's amazing. Batteries, power. You know, where can we actually get that energy source in a very light way? Those things are even really, really hard to do. So starting from the mechanism itself and then onto all the computation side, you know, we're still limited by the speed to control all this crazy degrees of, you know, this, the hand has 22 degrees of freedom. So we have to have ways to control all of them as well as millions of sensors that we have in our hands to return and then compute all of that within, you know, tens and hundreds of milliseconds and then spit the action back. Do you feel the field of neurobotics is getting all the resources it needs to pursue this research vigorously? 